Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Greet your neighbors. Today's invocation will be given by Don Bell. I'd like to share Gandhi's prayer for peace. Let us pray. I offer you peace. I offer you love. I offer you friendship. I see your beauty. I hear your need. I feel your feelings. My wisdom flows from the highest source. I salute that source in you. Let us work together for unity and peace. Amen. Thank you, Don. That was also the Montessori school. They used to say that every morning. Oh, my kids are in Montessori. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. A little shout out to the cooks today. Everything looks very nice here for Valentine's Day. Appreciate all the food. Bear with us a second. We have a little technical issue. I'll just go ahead with my announcements in a minute. If it comes up, I do have a picture I wanted to share, but it's fine. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, this past weekend, we had the four-way test uh, speech competition at Worcester High School. We had five candidates. Um, so thanks again to Kathy McConnell and John Scott, who helped me with the judging. Oh, there we go. Um, and our winner this year was Sammy Amir, and she was actually the winner last year. So she'll be going up to the district competition in April. So um, So we're going to do. Uh, there we go. Um, so just a reminder again the, about the flag renewals. I went into the database yesterday, and it looked like we had about 950 of our 2,000 flags in a renewed status, which is good. We're almost halfway there, um, but if if you haven't done that, make sure you go out and renew your flag and encourage others to do so as well. It really saves us a lot of work uh, in April um, of calling and trying to get people to renew. Our experience is most people do renew, but some of them wait until right before Memorial Day. So we're trying to really put a push on for that this year. Um, there's the picture from this weekend uh, with the contestants and our three judges there in the back. Um, also, just a reminder, um, and the new members uh, should have received an email from um, Robbie Ross this morning, that new member orientation session will be March 3rd at 12 p.m., and that will be on Zoom. Um, so here today in history, I thought, well, since it's Valentine's Day, I'd do a little research on Valentine's Day. It's kind of upset that I did that because it's, it's not very nice. <laughs> um, so in the third century AD, em Emperor Claudius had ordered St. Valentine to be beheaded on February 14th because he was marrying couples and he was against Christian marriage. So that's sort of the, the impetus for Valentine's Day. 
All right. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lynn with the Secretary of Treasury. I was just wondering who had big pockets or a big purse and is scoping out the extra chocolates up front. So on your way out, you can do the collection. Uh, we have two guests today. Uh, Vince Marion, if you'll start with uh, your guest. Great, thank you. Good to see everybody. Today, today is Jonathan Malay, Economic Development Coordinator for the wonderful city of Worcester. Right beside Vince, I'll ask Mary Beth Burns to stand. Mary Beth's my guest. She is president of Wayne Economic Development Council. So welcome, Mary Beth. We have more announcements than guests today. So we'll start with Chris Pycraft. We also have Tom Rumbaugh. Justin Starlin and Phil Mariola. And yes, we will have time for the program. <laughs> well, if you watched the Super Bowl, you probably thought like I did that uh, the halftime show was something special. And I was privileged to be old enough to be catered to by the Super Bowl halftime show. Um, I'm here to talk about Every Rotarian Every Year Again. This is Rotary International's request. We participate in a uh, fundraising campaign benefiting Rotary International's programs. They use the funds all around the world for three years, and those funds are eligible to come back to our own club through uh, our district after three years have elapsed. But this is the one and only time of year we ask you to consider making this donation. Um, it supports a great cause, helping people all over the world, uh, reminding us that our, organiza our organization is truly international in scope. If helping Rotary International is not enough motivation, one of the most common motivating factors for members of this club has been that the dollars donated count towards your uh, Paul Harris Fellow credit. Uh, everyone who contributes $1,000 over their lifetime is awarded a Paul Harris Fellow Award, and um, there are different levels to those donations. And we've had folks in the club, um, once they've achieved their own economic goals in terms of donation size, start uh, awarding those points to other members of the club who have not yet achieved Paul Harris Fellow status. So if that sounds to be of any interest to you, please contact Treasurer Greg or myself will help you make those arrangements. So again, the ask is $100 every Rotarian all over the world, one time a year, and that time for us is, is this month. So please consider participating in the program. Thank you. Well, I was, I was worried about coming up here and bringing everybody down, asking for volunteers, but after Terry's uh, St. Valentine's Day beheading, I'm feeling pretty good, <laughs> feeling pretty good about this. Uh, picture in your mind a big pile of flags that we need to go through and, and uh, assess damaged ones and, and dirty ones and getting them ready for the flag program uh, in May. We've, we've got a big pile of them. Um, I'm going to have a special maintenance day uh, this Wednesday at four o'clock to six o'clock. Can't be there the whole time. That's fine. Uh, but I will be at the flag building four to six. Give me a note if you can, an email, um, if you can make it. Um, that would be great. And um, yeah, let me know if you can. Uh, thanks. All right, hey, I'm here to round out uh, the Worcester Community Flag Project. That flag is down at the fairgrounds, it's awesome. A great project that uh, we undertook for our 100th anniversary. You're gonna hear about the Oak Hill Park here, uh, past president, Phil Mariola, but here's what we have, folks. We uh, obviously, so we set up an endowment fund. And I know we have talked about this for the last four or five months. We are proud to say that we have almost $100,000 in that endowment fund. And uh, we have raised money primarily through businesses uh, sponsoring the flag. There's a number of, of you that have sponsored uh, that, not sponsored the flag, but sponsored the ongoing maintenance uh, of the flag to make sure that it's not a, a hardship on the club long-term. So we, we do wanna ask if there's anybody interested in any kind of sponsorships. I know Cheryl, you have that up. Here's a photo of our flag. This is a little bit different than probably the Oak Hill project and the fact that our, our ranges for sponsorships are $2,500 for the small size sponsorship recognition, $5,000 for the medium, and $10,000 for our large size sponsorships. 
Those have the plaque or the sign that will be going at the base of the flag has not been produced yet because we're finalizing our ask here. Uh, those funds will be put in the, uh, the, the Wayne County Community Foundation and obviously uh, the revenue derived off of, of, of those uh, funds will be there for the ongoing maintenance of that flag in perpetuity, okay? A couple other things just why I got you. Every 90 days that flag comes down. So we bring it down every four or four times a year on March 11th, right around there. That's when we'll bring it down. It does go through a maintenance program as we can get about a year out of these flags um, if they are properly maintained. So yes, every 90 days they come down and uh, we would like to have three flags on uh, rotation right now. We have two in our arsenal. So if you would like to support the, uh, the flag program in honor or name of anybody or your business, you see the amounts there, 2,500, 5,000 or $10,000 uh, to make sure that it, uh, it, it maintains itself down there at the, at the fairground. So, Thank you for your uh, consideration. You can reach out to me, uh, President Terry, or Greg Longs uh, directly. Thank you. It's a little deflating when you type up your notes in number 14 font, and you still have to put your reading glasses on. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm here to talk about the Oak Hill Park Tree Project. Uh, 2021 was our 100th anniversary as a Rotary Club. We were chartered March 1st, 1921. Uh, a 100th anniversary committee was formed and we tossed around some ideas of projects which would honor our anniversary proper. And two emerged. One was the Big Flag Project, spearheaded by past President Justin. And the other was a tree planting project spearheaded by past presidents, Peggy Schmitz and Ron Holman. Justin has updated you on the Big Flag Project. I am up here to update you on the Tree Project. But first, I would love to urge you to please support our Every Rotarian Every Year campaign. It's the one time each year that every Rotary Club in the world is asked to donate to the Rotary Foundation which does so much good throughout the world. If you don't believe me, ask Bob Gorman, Peggy Schmitz, or Doug Druschel about what they saw when they went to Kenya as part of a Rotary Foundation grant to improve the water supply and latrine conditions of a small village. For your information, the Rotary Foundation receives four stars from Charity Navigator that's the highest thinking you can get, and very few organizations like us can achieve that. Now, on to the Oak Hill Park project. You should have you should have received an email from Secretary Lynn in the last hour, Lynn? <laughs> in the last hour, with information about our project and a donor form. About a year ago, we learned that OERDC had a lot of sizable trees, a 20 to 30 foot that needed to be relocated with the help of Joel Montgomery and others with the city of Worcester. We paid Davy Tree to rescue and relocate 27 trees to Oak Hill Park. Three were transplanted near the entrance on the right as you drive in, and 24 trees were transplanted on the north side of the walking trail to create a founder's row in honor of the 24 chartered members of this club. A kiosk near the trees lists the names of the 24 chartered members. So that was phase one, and it's been completed, and it's paid for. Phase two involves reforesting an area north of the trail and west of the Founders Road in conjunction with the city and Davy Tree by planting 50 smaller trees. The cost for phase two is estimated to be $21,000 and donations will be greatly appreciated. You'll have a donor form in your email today. We have already received some very generous donations from Worcester Rotarians, but more is needed. Donations of $500 or more will be acknowledged on permanent signs of the park. You may also sponsor a tree in honor of a loved one for $500. 
The honoree's name will appear on a signage which identifies the tree and includes the use of a QR code with information about that particular species. Volunteer opportunities will be available for site prep, planting, and maintenance this spring when the trees are planted. Phase three is the much larger in scope and Peggy and Ron will speak about that in the coming weeks. Our club does really, our club does not ask its members for money very often if you really think about it. We have Meals with a Mission and the Alabama Week Classic in the fall and that's about it. Every Rotarian every year is not really a club ask. Every club in the world is asked to support the Rotary Foundation once a year. So the Big Flag and the Oak Hill Park Tree Programs are a continuing effort to celebrate our 100th anniversary of Worcester Rotary. So now you have two choices. If you want to help, Big Flag or trees or both, depending on which project speaks to your heart. Either way, our club will benefit from your donation and your participation. Thank you, Phil. Um, one other quick reminder, um, I sent out in the weekly email uh, the, the wine tasting event that we're gonna have at the Worcester Country Club on April 5th. Um, in the email, um, I noted that you can uh, RSVP for that by sending an email to Samira or there's a sign-in sheet that Courtney has here today if you'd like to RSVP for that. And that's open to all Rotarians and a guest, whether that's your spouse or partner. So uh, we're looking forward to, to that event. Okay, I also realized that when Justin was up here, we had two starlings on the stage at the same time. You know, God help us. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to our guests, uh, Jonathan, Mary Beth. Hope you enjoyed today's program and the Fellowship of Worcester Rotary. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Don Noble who will introduce today's program. Thank you, President Terry. And uh, Phil, I'm going to try doing mine with 16 font without glasses. So I have to switch. You'll know why. But anyway, so we have a tag team team today. Uh, first, Renee Lagan is the Director of Partnerships and Air Engagement, sorry, with Team Neo, a Jobs Ohio Network partner. Ms. Lagan is a business development and sales expert whose 24 year career encompasses successful collaborations with elected officials, community agencies, municipalities, nonprofits, and small to large for-profit organizations. Ms. Lagon's fundamental objective at Team NEO is to cultivate a positive economic impact through the creation of tactical business alliances to grow and strengthen a more inclusive and equitable coordination of regional economic development network. Prior to joining Team NEO, she was the regional director for the Minority Business Assistance Center at the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, a program of the Ohio Development Services Agency, where she led a team of professional develop business advisors in the development of minority, women, disabled, and veteran-owned businesses across eight counties in the state of Ohio. Before joining the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, she was the assistant director of diversity and corporate relations at Case Western Reserve University, where she was the national lead consultant on key strategic project-based opportunities between the university and corporate sector for research engagements through the lens of diversity, talent development, and co-branding. Ms. Gallon's notable and numerous boards of director of appointments have included the Ohio Economic Development Association um, the Land, the Compact, UNICEF of Orlando, the Citrus Club of Women's Exchange, Youngstown State Minority Business Assistance Center, and numerous advisory roles to C-suite economic development leaders focused on local diversity, equity, and inclusion, including inclusion strategy. She is currently a member and a class officer for the Leadership uh, Cleveland class of 2020 and uh, LC2 2021. She holds a BA in Communications from John Carroll University and an MS in Human Resource Management from Nova Southeastern University. 
Our second speaker is a seasoned economic development professional. Sean Starland serves as Team NEO's Director of Project Management and Site Selection. In coordination with Jobs Ohio and community partners, Sean assists companies in seeking to relocate and expand in Northeast Ohio with the goal of facilitating and supporting job creation and capital investment throughout the region. Prior to joining Team NEO in 2019, Sean spent six years with the Wayne Economic Development Council, where he assisted in projects totaling more than one billion in capital investment, adding over 4,600 new jobs to the region. Sean also serves as the first executive director from the Holmes County Economic Development Council. Sean holds a bachelor's degree in urban studies from Ohio Wesleyan, and he said he's the better looking of the Starling brothers. You can pay him at $5 later. <laughs> Please give a warm word of your welcome to Renee and Sean as they present an update on Team Neo. Well, thank you, Dawn, for the wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I don't need to tell you more about who I am. And, let's see. All right, I want to start with this slide. This is me in high school competing for the four-way test for Rotary at Chardon High School. And I won that competition. And then I won the districts and I made it through three rounds, but I didn't make it to state. But I'm very proud of this photo. So when I said, Sean, I need you to put this in the slide before we need to get started. And then probably about 12 or 15 years later, I then became a Rotarian. And in the support of the community, working with our Rotary, uh, with our foreign exchange students, every year my husband and I would sleep on the floor of the community hall with foreign exchange students uh, to, you know, keep them company and, and introduce them to our city. So, uh, love Rotary, happy to be here. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about Team Neo and why I'm here. Um, we are the Northeast Ohio Region's nonprofit economic development organization where we accelerate, accelerate business growth and job creation across 18 counties. <clears throat> and as I go through this, I will give you kind of a, a, a quick outline. I'm gonna talk about our five strategies, I'm gonna talk about how we got started, and then Jobs Ohio. We are one of the six designated Jobs Ohio network partners. So if you look here on the screen, across our region, <clears throat> there are six of us. We cover the Northeast portion and we conduct research, data analysis to inform local conversations and solutions where we market Northeast Ohio globally, as well as nationally. And while we're doing that, we're seeking to increase our jobs, our education and training for our region's 4.3 million residents. But because we are focused on uh, the entire region, um, what it does for us is that we have a significant amount of power that we bring and that we bring together. We are the 15th largest U.S. market in our 18 counties. Think about that. Folks don't know the stat. When we look at economic development, 50 states, all the markets across the United States, 18 counties in Northeast Ohio, we are the 15th largest market. We have a tremendous amount of economic power in our 18 counties. And we can talk about more of why that is the case. We are 40%, if we just dial in a little bit, we are 40% of Ohio's economy, producing $235 billion in GDP, our higher education institutions, our three main industries, technology, uh, healthcare and manufacturing. We have 7,700 manufacturers here in our region with a highly integrated supply chain. Our manufacturing industry is a critical base for our region. So this means that it becomes necessary when we look at the power of our region that we understand our current assets, our talent, our workforce, our small business enterprise systems, all these become critical because it works together as one collaborative network. It requires every sector of our economy to focus on these specific areas where my team Neo acts as a strength and a complementary partner where we plug in to each one of these ecosystem partners to 
to understand the opportunities, create, op create opportunities, and drive attractive assets to our region. And when we're driving attractive assets, we're talking to companies internationally, we're talking to companies nationally, we're understanding the scope and scale of what's happening locally, like we're working with Mary Beth at the Wayne County Economic Development. It is important to know where these assets exist, where are the business retention and expansion opportunities that we can bring here uh, to the region and those that we can leverage. Here's an example of a project where we were recently actively engaged in, and we have many recent projects, but uh, post this or uh, after this one, but in particular, Sherwin Williams. I mean, I know I bought a ton of uh, paint during COVID. The inside of my house looks great. Uh, Sherwin Williams ought to be really happy, <laughs> but um, I was very happy that they decided to stay here. And Team Neo was just one of the many organizations involved in that recent successful effort to keep Sherwin Williams here. Um, we lead where it makes sense. And if we're not leading, we're playing a very high value support role. John Marika, CEO uh, and chairman of Sherwin Williams, noted the importance that we played in helping to be a part in uh, keeping them here in our region. Next, I'm going to talk about our high strategies. This is really the, the bread and butter where we're driving every day. We've got five lanes, we're in a car, we're driving, and I drive in 18 counties, and it feels like a whole heck of a lot more than five lanes. <laughs> But uh, of the five strategies, addressing talent, supply demand gaps, growing a pipeline of competitive sites, and advancing technology adoption, those three rise to the top from a transformational perspective because that's where we focus our business, business retention and expansion activities in. Transactional in nature is where I play all day long, where I'm driving in the lanes, I'm promoting Northeast Ohio, I'm engaging to draw a more stronger, more effective economic development network, bringing collaborations together so that we work together to grow our region. So what does it mean when we're addressing the supply demand gap? Um, we provide data to our region's workforce, a supply chain transportation, market competitiveness, we want you to know what are the gaps in talent in the workforce. Um, you communicate that to us from a local level. We need to understand that when we're talking to large corporations, international and national, we're looking on our soil. They're asking about talent. They're asking about those opportunities. So we have to be ears on the ground to know what's going on in your house locally so that we can communicate that to stakeholders who might be looking to um, uh, come on our soil. Um, we assess that, if you uh, looked at our recent misaligned and aligned opportunities reports, um, those reports talked about the challenges and opportunities we have in our region, which are critical. Uh, advancing technology, uh, no, it's growing a pipeline of competitive sites and getting ahead of myself. Um, Team Neo uh, looks at about 60 sites per year that we look to bring here um, or uh, to cultivate here uh, uh, locally or regionally. And in our site selection process, um, we have communities that have the opportunity to be way more competitive uh, by having those sites ready for, you know, international, as I get it, national companies, and sometimes even local companies who, are, who want to expand. It's a strategy that is critical to how we advance economic development growth. And as companies seek to find locations that meet their needs and demands for land, we want to have intel on infrastructure, rail, water, real estate. All of those things matter when we're speaking with um, stakeholders who are looking to grow into our soil. And there's one big project that we know took place, and it had to do with that having the right site just in time, shovel ready. Uh, and I'm sure Sean will talk some more about that as he goes to some of the project work that he does. Uh, technology adoption. Uh, as previously noted, concerning the power of our region, um, we have 7,700 manufacturers, as I noted. But the challenge with our manufacturers, that is a core base here. We have to be nationally and globally competitive in our manufacturing industry. It is too much of, a, has so much density here in our region. Our manufacturers have the opportunity to make sure their technology is competitive globally and nationally. If not, 
you're looking at 7,700 manufacturing companies. If they are not advancing with technology, they could be left behind even on supply chain, could be left behind on you know, opportunities to hold on, major opportunities to grow our region even further, create more jobs. So we look, do we do technology needs assessments with our manufacturing companies? We inform and influence strategies for them to become more real time in terms of technology so that they are working in to the future and not 10 years behind. This is our last strategy and it's certainly not the least, and, but it's one that I consider one of the most foundational strategies by which we all operate, grow and strengthen. Uh, and that's creating a more coordinated inclusive regional network. Uh, this is one that I drive in all day long. Um, there's three areas of focus with this one. We wanna be seen as a trusted partner with our economic development organizations, valuing our local economic development corporations like what Wayne County is doing, connecting with our business retention and expansion teams, providing ourselves as that collaborative for our partner to sell the value, not just of the region as a whole, but understanding what's going on in our local day-to-day -day economic development organizations so we can sell that value as well. Strengthening relationships with elected officials, my role, I work with our federal, state, local elected officials, day in, day out, our C-suite economic development directors. That relationship is important because we need their collaboration at the table concerning economic development. They are driving policy that matters. And so when they're in their seat driving that policy, we want to know that the policy is not affecting our infrastructure, access to rail, water, sewer, whatever it might be. Do we have necessary funding? As companies look at us, we want to be valuable to them. So partners with our elected officials is critical. Um, improving trust, uh, engagement, support of our local diversity, equity, and inclusion networks. We work to solve these challenges that drive systemic inequities in job creation, job promotion, and job preparation. Um, by doing all these things, we believe that if we do them well, we will advance the job creation talent uh, will be more attractive to our region. Uh, we'll have business retention expansion in, in a more diverse and inclusive way. And here, just really quick, here's some updated numbers uh, concerning what our impact has looked like over the past uh, five years, since 2015. I think we're on our sixth on this one. Um, we had 44,635 new jobs with 2.3 billion in annual payroll and 11 billion in capital investments. Much of this work right here is attributed to when you um, meet someone like Sean Starling, who is the superstar of project management with Team Neo. Uh, he is the one that is on the ground working with our international national companies, talking and, and working the deals with Jobs Ohio to get those incentives, those loans and those grants in here uh, so that they choose us, they choose our state, they choose our region. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Sean to talk about all the, the, the fun work he does all day, every day. Thanks, Renee. You know, I was really glad that Don got my name right. Recently, I, I ran into one of my classmates, a classmate that I spent a lot of time with. We were at Worcester Fest, and he called me Justin. It was really <laughs> insulting. <laughs> um, so as, as Don mentioned um, during his introduction, I, I serve as a project manager for Team Neo. Um, my role consists of evaluating growth opportunities for state support. In this role, I formulate and present formal recommendations for incentives to Jobs Ohio leadership, taking into account a number of factors um, I'm joined by three other colleagues in providing project management services across the 18 county region. So I'm here today to show, to kind of provide an overview of 2021 and our performance. Um, before I do so, I'm gonna set the stage by explaining um, how Jobs Ohio makes decisions in Columbus. Um, <clears throat> so I can tell you that the due diligence process um, at Jobs Ohio is very comprehensive. Um, however, the organization was really set up to move at the speed of business. So decisions regarding assistance are generally made rather quickly. I tell companies that I advocate for that typically um, I can return a formal offer letter to them in seven to 10 business days um, once I receive their project information. So 
is pretty quick. Um, in terms of state support, it falls in three broad categories, grants, loans, and tax credits. Yes, almost every company asks for the free money, but oftentimes other programs are required to fill the gap in order for the project to move forward. I add emphasis, emphasis to fill the gap because Jobs Ohio is never the primary financial contributor in any deal. Rather, the organization plays the role of gap filler in order to influence business decisions. In almost any corporate decision, time, risk, and money are the mitigating factors. In some cases, Jobs Ohio is able to set, step in and <clears throat> make the numbers work. In other instances, the void is too, too large to overcome. Um, as a quick reminder here, if you take a look at this photo um, and of this guy jumping over this cliff, I would never recommend doing that without shoes on. Um, that looks <laughs> incredibly dangerous. Um, so um, you ask yourself, what are the factors that are taken into consideration um, in evaluating a, a kit, an opportunity for support? Well, there are several. Um, industry sector, Jobs Ohio has nine targeted industries um, from advanced manufacturing to financial services to food and agribusiness. Uh, it is a well-rounded list. All projects receiving incentives through Jobs Ohio's um, standard programs must fall within one or more of these traded sectors. Location, what's the status of the community the business is located to or expanding in? Is it distressed or is it well-to-do? What are the, the median wages of that community? How will the anticipated growth um, impact the local economy? Also taking it into consideration. Competition, this is very significant. Does the business have the ability to locate production outside the state of Ohio? How real is the threat? And what's required to improve the state's competitive position? And finally, like it or not, um, the Jobs Ohio model is still highly focused on the big three. Big three consisting of net new job growth, net new payroll, and fixed asset investment. The Jobs Ohio's um, assessment takes into account where the business is today and where they expect to be three to five years down the, round, down the road. I share this background information with you so you can better understand and, and appreciate the process. Um, as perhaps the most unique economic development model in the US, Jobs Ohio takes the vetting process very seriously. Um, support is viewed as an investment in a company and not as a corporate handout. Um, so it is required to, that all projects have significant rationale. Also, I provide this information as a context to the numbers that I'm gonna share here. So how did the, the region perform in, in 2021? Um, if we were to rewind to the start of the year, uh, we had just elected a new president. The pandemic was still a major concern with the first vaccines being released at the very end of 2020. Uh, the supply chains, they were a wreck and there was a lot of economic uncertainty um, and for countless reasons. Well, I'm here to tell you that it was a record year. A year surpassing every milestone we track regionally a year in which the state of Ohio performed exceedingly well. In fact, um, as Renee had pointed out, about 40% of Ohio's GDP is derived in Northeast Ohio. Um, from a, a project perspective on an annual basis, we feel more inquiries and bring more incentive offers um, than our contemporaries in the other five regions of the state. Um, my, myself and my colleagues, vetted hundreds of leads for support 2021. Ultimately, as you can see here, these efforts resulted in 104 wins and approximately 7,500 net new jobs. To put this into perspective, um, we typically experience just 70 to 80 wins per year. Um, so we were well above norm. I would say that the projects making up this list of 104 include companies big and small, from five to 10 employee family owned businesses to Amazon. Um, so what, what really drove growth in 2021? 
So here are some factors that I've encountered in my work. Um, now, by no means is this an exhaustive list, um, but I think my colleagues would, would pretty much agree with my observation. So I'm gonna to quickly touch upon the first four. Again, what drove corporate expansion decisions um, and why the, why the additional project activity in 2021? So first one is a, a change in consumer spending habits. With the pandemic, we've, we've become online consumers. We log in, we point and click, a few days later, a box arrives at our doorstep. Project activity not only involved retailers adjusting their model to become more e-commerce centric, um, but it also, um, but we also saw considerable growth from new online players in the market. A prime example in 2021 is online car reseller Carvana. They opened a huge used car processing and detailing center in Grand County. It brought 300 new jobs to the community and $30 million in investment. To paint a picture of that operation, um, the site will hold approximately 9,000 cars and trucks at any given time. In addition to B2C companies building out their national distribution networks, a la Amazon. We also saw an abundance of activities from businesses outfit, outfitting logistical hubs. Um, within the 104 wins include several projects from companies manufacturing conveyor systems and material handling equipment. Ambiflex in Canton uh, is one such company. They specialize in spiral conveying technology. So our shopping habits have and will continue to grow, to drive growth in Ohio due to our strong logistical position um, in serving both the East Coast and, and Midwest market. The second one on the list is supply chain. As clearly stated on this slide, some companies' products are in high demand because of the lack of domestic availability. Companies forced to compete for low cost imports, whether it be components like microchips, or finished goods are now seeing demand for their products skyrocket. I'm currently working with a company that manufactures high volume, low margin um, products for the restaurant industry. They can't produce enough product. In addition to bringing on a host of new customers, existing customers are placing orders above and beyond the norm to account for future scarcity. We will continue to see project activity investment to account for disruption in the market. Third one on this list is vertical integration. <clears throat> Companies are looking to control their own destiny, bringing a larger portion of production in-house. While this is not isolated um, to overseas suppliers, we are seeing a lot of onshoring or reshoring of production. Businesses are crippled when we critically outsource components, sit on boats, and do not enter port, that, that don't enter the port. So vertical integration is something that we're seeing. Emerging and disruptive technology. Like it or not, we're becoming an electric-based society. Um, with the move, Northeast Ohio is winning projects related to this conversion. This goes for battery suppliers like LG Chem, automotive OEM, OEMs transitioning their product offering, and machinery and equipment manufacturers um, <clears throat> serving the consumer market. Uh, not to offend anyone, but businesses once serving a male clientele are now seeing sales hikes as women are more comfortable with handling their products. Um, this year, I bought an electric chainsaw and to be honest, it's a glorified hedge trimmer. Um, nonetheless, my wife uses it, and I can tell you that there is no way that she would be comfortable using a, gap, a gas operated hand, uh, chainsaw. So we're seeing a lot of growth on account of that. Um, the pipeline for these opportunities will continue to rise. We've got two more listed here. People have to eat. Yes, they do. Um, and Ohio and, and Wayne County are, are blessed with. Uh, a plethora of food manufacturers and uh, you know what they're going to continue to see growth um, and, and we've seen activity on their behalf. In addition, um, last year we saw a lot of activity from COVID suppliers and COVID pivot companies. Um, I think that we will see the tailing off of those opportunities as, as 
as the, the pandemic kind of, I don't know, we get used to it. <laughs> uh, again, these are some of the factors that I personally observed in 2021. There is um, more growth drivers that, 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 there's one more growth driver that I'd like to, to point to. Um, and that growth driver is a, a new program. So Jobs Ohio um, for years has, has received headlines with really big projects. Companies making huge investments, companies <clears throat> creating a lot of jobs. Well, local communities have said for a long time, like the WEDC, uh, like the chambers have said, hey, Jobs Ohio, you're, you're missing the boat. You're incentivizing big business. What about small to mid-sized business? They, 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 um, they drive the, the economy. Um, Jobs Ohio listened. And in 2020, it came out with the Jobs Ohio Inclusion Program. Um, and it's designed to meet the needs of small and business-sized businesses, a, a population that, that it hadn't support, supported before. There are some qualifications for the program, um, but uh, I will say that it has been met with a lot of fun fanfare and that we have a number of opportunities that are currently being vetted in Wayne County for this, this program. So if you know of a small business, to mid-sized business that is looking to expand, this is an opportunity for them to potentially get some, some state support. Um, I'll close by saying that, hey, the pipeline, for Jobs Ohio's pipeline, our pipeline of projects that, that we are vetting remain strong. We, have, we currently have 180 growth opportunities that we're vetting. That represents 10,000 net new jobs. Um, so I think the 2022 will be a really good year. There are some limiting factors that, that, may, that may cause some disruption, um, that may hinder growth. Uh, I think that I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a little bit of a labor shortage that's a concern. Um, in addition, I think that inflation and rising wages could potentially hurt growth. Um, when will the bubble hit? I don't know, um, but, but again, it looks like things appear to be very promising for for the future. Thanks. Oh, so we probably have just about a minute if anybody has any questions. If not, would you, Sean and Ray, would you be able to stay afterward? Oh, yep. Okay. Okay. All right, Sean, Renee, thank you for giving us an update on Team Neo. Um, I think the general public doesn't appreciate all the effort that goes in. We often see it in the newspaper when a company is located here or we retain a company, but nobody's thinking about all the effort that, that goes into doing that. So we appreciate what Team Neo does for the region as well as all the other organizations. So in recognition of your time with us today, we have this rendition of our rotary wheel. And on the back is our four-way test, and these are made locally by the Village Network. Thank you. <laughs> so a couple of quick reminders. Um, remember, uh, if you want to help with flag maintenance to get a hold of Tom Rumbo uh, this Wednesday, four to six at the maintenance facility. Um, make sure you RSVP for the wine tasting event. I think I saw the, the sign up sheet going around. Um, and next week we will have Marty Kerr who will be giving us an update on the Worcester Oilers hockey team. We'll also have a classification talk from one of our new members. So have a good week, Rotarians. We stand adjourned. <laughs>